Hi everyone, Dan Edmonds again, and this time I've brought a Honda Civic Type R. I used to tune suspensions for a living, but what you might not know is I used to race a Honda Civic CRX and a Honda Civic SI. I'm especially interested to take the wheels off of this one to see what the engineers have done to handle what is almost three times as much horsepower as my cars used to have. I've also got a couple of special surprises to help show some of that in detail. But before I get started, remember to like, subscribe, share with your friends, all the things. Wow, look at that. That does not look like a regular Civic up here, not at all. Let's get in closer and take a look at what we've got here. They call this a dual axis strut front suspension. What do they mean by dual axis? Well, I'm gonna turn the wheel and keep an eye on the strut when I do that and you might be able to see what they're talking about. You probably saw it, right? The brake and hub turned, but the strut didn't. And that's not how strut suspensions normally work. Usually the strut turns right along with this. So what we're seeing is the second axis, which is evidenced by this upper ball joint here and all the structure that's behind. So why'd they do it? Well, the Type R has 306 horsepower coming out of its two liter turbo engine and it's all coming through the front wheel, so they had to do something to combat torque steer. This lower ball joint at the end of the lower control arm looks fairly conventional, and it indeed works with the pivot bearing at the top of the strut to define the axis of the suspension's vertical movement over bumps. But the dual axis design means these two familiar suspension hardpoints don't have any real effect on steering geometry. That's where the added upper and nearly hidden lower ball joints come in. Their independent orientation allowed the engineers to redefine and optimize the steering axis to best suit the Type R's performance mission. You know, putting down all that horsepower and giving it really good steering feeling so that it's fun to drive. This air deflector diverts air coming in through an opening in the bumper towards the caliper and rotor. Just behind it, you can see the end of the stabilizer bar where it connects to the drop link, which connects further up to the strut. The stabilizer bar here is 29 millimeters in diameter. It's hollow, and it's got 5 millimeter wall thickness. Compare that to the standard bar, which is 25 and a half millimeters in diameter with 4 millimeters of wall thickness. If you do all the math, you wind up with a stabilizer bar here that is 75% stiffer than a standard bar. This is an interesting piece. It has nothing to do with the stabilizer bar. It bolts to the lower arm itself on the inside, and then it bolts to this added fork on uh, the outer end, and basically it's there to keep the fork from moving when you turn the wheel so that just the outer piece moves. Then right here we have the height sensor that's connected to the lower arm as well to keep track of the suspension's movement so the, the uh, system can make uh, adjustments to the shock absorbers. The Type R as we know it was introduced in 2017. And in 2020 they made a few tweaks, basically just the usual mid-cycle refresh, but they made some pretty important ones as it pertains to performance. It's not just cosmetic. We're looking at one of them right here. It's this two-piece rotor that goes along with the four-piston Brembo brakes. Uh, they've made this change. It used to be a one-piece rotor, but now it's got an aluminum center section and a cast iron ring, and of course, lots of bolts to hold the two together. But it allows this to float just a little bit so that vibration isn't transferred back through the steering wheel to the driver, but also it reduces unsprung weight because this setup is lighter than an all cast iron rotor. The Type R is unique in the Civic lineup in that it has electronically controlled dampers. 
but for 2020 they made a huge improvement that you might not be able to see because it's pretty much all on the electronic side. The system used to operate at 2000 Hertz but now it's 10 times faster, 20,000 Hertz. And that means the system can recognize what's going on and make adjustments a whole lot faster. As you can see, there's a lot of aluminum here. Uh, what they call the fork, the upright or the steering knuckle. Normally this is one piece, but here it's two. And of course, the lower control arm itself. Those are all steel or iron in a normal Civic. So it looks like they're trying to reduce unsprung mass. But it's a little bit more complicated than that. And I think now's a good time for me to show you these pieces off the car. Yeah, I've got a special surprise and that's it. I've got some of these pieces on a bench so we can look at them in isolation. I've always wanted to do this. Visual aids for a suspension deep dive. This is a first for me. And I've taken it even a step further because I've got standard Honda Civic stuff and the Civic Type R's components. Obviously, these are the lower control arms. I'm going to start at the bottom and build up from there. This one's steel. It's a stamping. The ball joint is bolted on as a separate piece with three nuts and bolts. This one's aluminum. The ball joint isn't configured the same way. As you can see, there's a boss here for something to press in from the top. And then there's this little linkage here, which we'll figure out in a short while. What they share is a mounting strategy because they bolt onto the same subframe. Um, so the bushings look similar. So here are the struts. Regular Civic Type R. The spring seats look pretty similar, but there are many differences. For one, this bracket for the stabilizer bar attachment. Uh, it's a lot more robust on the Type R. There's also a difference in the way they mount. The normal Civic slides into the upright until it hits this collar. The Type R's mounting is completely different with one bolt going through this bracket and another one going through this notch here. But the biggest difference is this is an electronically controlled damper and this is the unit that makes the adjustments. The difference is here. This is what we came to see. This is where the biggest differences lie, as you can see. I don't even need to tell you that. This is the standard Civic. Uh, the strut drops in here, ball joint attaches here, steering here, and the brakes to these two ears. And then the hub and bearing assembly presses in here. Pretty standard, not very heavy, even though it's cast iron because, well, it's not very big. This, on the other hand, has a lot more going on and a lot more pieces. I've bolted at least four pieces together and there's a few bolts involved in that as well. And you can see that this is completely different. The main fork assembly here on the back attaches to the strut here. And here's the lower ball joint that attaches to the arm that we saw before. But there's two more ball joints right here. And these are the ones that make up the dual axis. This is the steering axis that is independent from the main axis of the strut, which goes between this and the top of the strut bearing. So yeah, when they say dual axis, that's what they mean. So this is what the standard Civic looks like all bolted together. I wanted to show you though, what this looks like as I put it together, because then you'll see what this is all about. Um, it's a little bit clumsy, so bear with me. So first we'll put the ball joint in there. But if I turn this a little bit, you can see that this little ear here provides a place for this link to go. So I'm going to put that together. This is not the right nut. Uh, I picked one that wasn't a locking nut, so this would be easy to demonstrate. Now we can see what this link does. It prevents this from turning when I steer the, uh, the knuckle, or when the driver steers the knuckle. The regular Civic, when you steer the wheel, the whole strut moves. And the steering axis is defined by this point here, which you can see when you open the hood. It's the nut in the middle of the upper strut mount. And this 
lower ball joint. So the steering axis follows that imaginary line between those two points. Contrast that to the Type R, which has a separate steering axis. And you can see that the geometry of it is quite a bit different. And that was why they went to all this trouble in order to optimize the geometry so they could put over 300 horsepower to the ground and have it be manageable and fun to drive. So what this does is it creates a different steering axis between this point and this point. And they've arranged the geometry so that imag imaginary line goes through the middle or pretty close to it of the CV joint here, which turns when you turn the wheel. So that small offset reduces the tendency towards torque steer. But it goes beyond that. If you project that line all the way to the ground through the tire, it'll be close to the center of the tire's contact patch. And that also reduces the tendency for torque steer. Furthermore, if I turn it this way, you can see how they've moved this point here forward relative to the lower control arms ball joint. And that increases the caster. Increased caster uh, improves self-aligning torque by helping the wheel return to center more naturally on its own. Uh, there's about eight degrees of caster here, whereas the regular Civic is in the neighborhood of five degrees. So big increase in caster as well. And then, of course, they were able to optimize the camber angle of this face in the process. And this has about a degree and a half of static negative camber, whereas the standard Civic is about a half a degree. So yeah, they're able to optimize the camber as well. So lots of benefits to steering geometry and suspension geometry. Um, and you know, there is a weight penalty for all of that. Uh, just looking at these two pieces, this assembly weighs about 15 pounds more than this one. So that's some unsprung mass to give away, but that's how important optimum steering geometry really is to the Type R. And I think we can't forget that the Type R is just a version of the Civic. So these two points and this point are the same in both cases. They'd have to be because you're bolting this on to the same chassis. And again, that's why going through all this trouble was worth it because they couldn't redesign the whole car. They could just redesign this part. Well, that about sums it up for the front. I'm going to put this tire on and move to the back. Well, here we are at the back, and I got to say, this isn't nearly as radical as what we saw in the front. Obviously, this vehicle has a much wider track width, so there's some different parts here, but it's mainly restricted to the knuckle and a few bushings. The rear suspension here is a multi-link type that I like to see. This is known as a control blade multi-link suspension. There may be other names for it, but that's the one that I know best. It's comprised of one upper link, and it's got a real deep dip here to get back up underneath there to mount to the subframe way back up there, even though the body's here. That's pretty typical. This is usually considered a camber link because it helps to hold the camber angle. Then there are two lateral links at the bottom, one much longer than the other. The longer one has the spring, the shock absorber, and the stabilizer bar mounted to it. And then up front here, we have this big arm. And it's an arm because it's bolted rigidly in two places to the rear knuckle here. And so, uh, and then it mounts up underneath this cover in a big bushing. And what this longitudinal arm does is locate the suspension in the fore and aft direction, but it also reacts all the brake torque. Uh, and that's really important because that means all of these links the other three links, all they have to concern themselves with is lateral loads. And that makes it easier to optimize the bushings. So this view shows that I was a little mistaken earlier. The shock absorber doesn't attach to the link. It attaches directly to the knuckle. So this has a one-to-one -one motion ratio, which is great. And this is the electronic adjuster, by the way, like we saw in the front. But the spring does rest on this longer lower link and this is about 70 percent of the way out from the inner pivot which is just past the muffler mount there 
to uh, the outer pivot. So that's the efficiency of the spring. You'll get uh, 7 tenths of an inch of spring compression for every inch of wheel motion. Uh, likewise, the stabilizer bar attaches to this bolt. That looks to be about 40% of the way out from the pivot point, so the stabilizer bar's motion ratio or efficiency will be about 40%. The rearmost lower link is a lot longer than the front one, which terminates here. This one terminates here. Quite a difference. Um, so why do that? Well, because their lengths are so dramatically different, they'll swing through different arcs. As the suspension compresses, this one's apparent position won't change that much. That one will change a little bit more because of the shorter arc. And what that means is in long sweeping corners, the suspension will tend to tow in a little bit. And that helps to stabilize the vehicle uh, through long sweeping corners. Honda has doubled down on that a little bit in 2020 by making this bushing right here stiffer than it was in 2017 through 2019. So there will be less bushing deflection, which will enhance that stabilizing dose of toe in. The Type R's track width is considerably wider than other Civics, and a lot of that comes from this unique aluminum knuckle that it has. And I say unique because it's just different, a different part number. It's not like revolutionary or anything like that. Most of the braking happens in the front, especially with a front wheel drive car like this, which has kind of a nose heavy weight distribution to begin with. So we have a single piston sliding caliper here. It's painted Brembo red, so it'll match the actual Brembos in the front. The main thing here though, is it's got an electronic parking brake uh, actuator that's built into the back of it. The Type R rolls on 24530 ZR20 tires on eight and a half by 20 inch rims. Let's see how much they weigh. 52 and a half pounds. That's not bad at all considering how much rubber and how much wheel there is here. Well, that about wraps it up for this close up look at the Honda Civic Type R's unique suspension. I'm gonna put the tire back on and go inside and figure out what I'm going to bring out next time. If you have any thoughts on that, please leave them in the comments. And remember to like, subscribe, share with your friends, all the things. Until next time, this is Dan Edmonds saying thanks for watching.